I am now pleased to welcome to the stage Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett, a Democrat representing the United States Virgin Islands in Congress. Congresswoman Plaskett is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. She has been a strong advocate of criminal justice reform and programs aimed at reducing recidivism. Bob, back to you. Thanks, Chad. Uh, Congresswoman, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, you represent the, the Virgin Islands. Can you just, what, what, what do your constituents say about the criminal justice reform system? How is it sure. compared to, to states, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, internally, you know, we have issues with regard to uh, our corrections and our prison systems in terms of needing. Uh, we're under a lot of consent decrees because of lack of funding to support the prison system itself. But because of how we're strategically situated, um, we're the most southern and most eastern part of the United States, and we're purchased really as a transshipment and as a block from German U-boats in World War I. Um, the, some of the most innovative uh, enterprises are, of course, drugs. And so we're used now as a major hub, us in Puerto Rico as a major hub from, for drug transportation. So we end up having uh, quite a number of Virgin Islanders that are in the federal prison system. Mm -hmm. and, this, and this law that passed <clears throat> deals with the federal system. Exactly. does not deal with the state system. Sure. And that's something that, that uh, some say, well, listen, that's got to be addressed because most prisoners uh, are at the state level. Sure, the but level. Uh, you know, first step is, of course, a first step. But there's right. always the question of uh, funding towards, you know, the, the detractors to this bill have said that it really doesn't touch the financing that the federal government does for the state level which is where it really needs to be done. But you know, I look at this bill also from a perspective of having been a prosecutor in New York um, and then being a, a member of the Department of Justice working for the Deputy Attorney General and understanding what the ramifications are at, you know, at those levels. Seeing it as a, you know, a narcotics prosecutor and then also uh, the policymaker at Maine Justice. As a prosecutor, what, what were some of the examples of, of the biggest injustices that you saw in the system? Oh. Well, well, you know, I mean, I take it, it it's it, one of the reasons why I left being a prosecutor. I prosecuted cases in New York City, mm -hmm. in the Bronx. I was a member of the Bronx District Attorney's Office right after a law school from AU. I know that that's one of your sponsors here. <laughs> so I got to give a shout out to Washington College of Law. Um, was seeing myself across the aisle so often. And, uh, you know, being a prosecutor and you're protecting, and I saw being a prosecutor as protecting victims and protecting my community. And that's something I think that does not come across to people often enough. I uh, tended to use uh, other, other forms and, you know, and, and um, other means of, of, uh, of punishment rather than actual car incarceration. New York City did a tremendous job of finding other um, ways for alternatives to prison um, where I could. It was the constant uh, movement of bodies in front of the judge that looked like I, I'm one of my sons. I have four sons. Mm -hmm. And that became you know, very heart-wrenching and um, just really um, something that really pulled at you. Additionally, um, the Bronx District Attorney's Office had within its jurisdiction Rikers Island. And Rikers Island, you know, many people know and see, have been the case of reason why there needs to be reform in prison systems because of people being left there for as many um, months or years without a trial. And I saw that play out uh, so often because one, there was, although the prosecutors were um, had speedy trial um, rules that had made us have to be ready and go to trial. Defense attorneys and public, prosec um, public defenders didn't have those. Hmm. So they were allowed to adjourn cases and adjourn cases and adjourn cases um, for indefinite periods of time. And individuals that are being brought in from Rikers Island, um, which is where you were held until you are sentenced, um, in New York City, you know, they always say, uh, if you hear some of the raps, they'll talk about a year and a day. The extra day is so that you're sent to upstate because Rikers Island is for only four prisons that are um, less than a year. Oh, I see, okay. Um, so that was really the issue, is just seeing people who were in Rikers Island waiting for a trial for uh, long periods of time. Uh, were you surprised that uh, the First Step Act got through and got to the president's desk? <clears throat> well, I think in Congress, anything that has uh, bipartisan support 
uh, which seems to be the most difficult part of being in Washington right now, is finding that has a chance of actually making it through. Um, what I found very interesting was the uh, fight between different versions of the bill. Mm -hmm. And um, really being um, particularly uh, intrigued by which members of Congress uh, were able to get their bill through, you know, that being uh, my good friend Hakeem Jeffries mm -hmm. and Collins, as you saw here earlier, um, whereas there were other bills which, which were um, put forward by maybe more senior members um, that did not. And so I think it was a coalition of individuals really pulling on those Republicans who saw this as a moral imperative, but also saw it as a financial one mm -hmm. as well. You know, uh, since 1980, uh, our prison system has grown 700 percent. But that also means that since that time period, uh, the spending and the costs have grown 600 percent. So those numbers are staggering. And I think for fiscal conservatives, that's an issue that they wanted to address as well. Uh, a, a number of critics raised the issue about the prison industry and the financial incentives. Um, should that be looked at? Should that be changed significantly? Because I mean, it, I, think, you know. I think that's the next step, um, is how to reduce the, to disincentivize, mm -hmm. if that's the word. Um, the private sector from uh, increased incarcerations. You know, we've heard horror stories about judges who receive pecuniary interest in putting people in prisons through other um, means, uh, through backdoor means, but also just how the system works itself that encourages that. Um, <clears throat> but maybe also encouraging um, the cost for non-prison sentencing. So making a much more robust financially alternative system where there's much more funding and support for the private sector in creating job training, um, in creating community service, in supporting those social services and communities that those who would have been incarcerated can actually fulfill. Uh, and then I, I think that that's a way to support the, um, the reduction in the cost to the prison uh, in industry mm -hmm. and at the same time creating a safety net and support for nonprofits and social programs and support in communities that really needed that support as well. And are those programs, especially let's say someone goes to prison and then gets out, mm -hmm. uh, that moment is very important. For job training, <coughs> as you mentioned, the community coming together, are those programs just lacking? I think there isn't sufficient programs. There isn't um, sufficient financial support um, from the federal government and from local government for those programs. Because um, we know that there's a need, um, but r making sure that individuals have that, uh, those opportunities is one. You know, I have been supportive of legislation, <coughs> excuse me, that bans the box mm -hmm. so that when individuals come out of prison, they're able to at least get through the application process before one might find out that they have had um, prison, a prison sentence. Um, it's just in the Virgin Islands, uh, people don't realize that food stamps. Uh, states are allowed to, most states uh, do not allow food stamps to individuals who have a conviction. Mm. So these are people who uh, would want to feed their families while they're looking, you know, it creates a safety net for them. And a state has to waive the restriction. And many states have not done that. So federal funding is available to a state for food stamps for individuals who have had a prison sentence if the state waives it. And in the Virgin Islands, we had not waived that for a number of years. Uh, and I was able to get the local legislature just last year to waive that restriction so that men and women who are coming out of the prison system and want to reunite with their families, want to create a, a, a family environment and want to have some safety net, at least are able to feed uh, the people in their family while they're looking for work, while they're getting job training. Uh, we'll open up for questions in two minutes. Um, mental illness is raised mm -hmm. by a questioner. Uh, did you see a lot of that where the mentally ill are just incarcerated and that's the, that's the solution? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because we face that in my community. That's a tremendous uh, um, issue that we have. Uh, so much of those individuals who are mentally ill may have had some violence and so they're put into the prison system, or you find that people who have drug addictions are really just self-medicating for mental illnesses that they have, 
And so they fall into the system under drug charges, mm -hmm. possessions, um, petty uh, selling as well, and how to uh, deviate or how to separate those individuals who are actually engaged in criminal conduct and those individuals who either have mental illness or have drug possession or drug sales because of mental illness, I think is something that we need to look at. I know that there had been in the original bill some discussion about that, and that was one of the things that um, did not make it through in the end. So, I mean, as, it's, as the bill says, this is a first step, mm -hmm. uh, and we can't let it be the last, but I think it's significant in, in what it's done. It's opened up the discussion. We found a way to be bipartisan, and uh, we need to continually make increments and movements in the right direction. We'll open up to for audience uh, questions. If you could just wait for the, the mic to, to get to you and identify yourself. This is, this is always the best part to me about questions. I always tell people, don't be afraid to ask me a question. Because when I was a prosecutor in New York, I actually was in front of Judge Judy. Oh, really? And her husband, um, Judge Scheinlin, <laughs> were judges that we had to go for. So I can take it. <laughs> oh, yeah, their well, questions are better than mine. Yeah. Too. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, Suzanne Bergeron with the National Urban League. Now that we have um, a different attorney general, um, how do you see uh, the relationship or working with him in implementation of the First Step Act where, where he has jurisdiction? Um, you know, it would have been great if we had maybe uh, talked about some other um, decriminalization you know, taught discussions about marijuana and some others, uh, if we had known that Jeff Sessions was going to leave and Barr was going to be the attorney general. You know, I think that he's practical. Uh, and I also think there is the, what will probably resonate with him is the amount of caseload and, um, and the work that his prosecutors throughout the country are doing. And this is really supportive of them. Uh, I find that a lot of pros people who are on the ground doing this work do support these kinds of legislation. They feel tied oftentimes as prosecutors by the sentencing guidelines that have been in place and unable to make decisions um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And so I would think uh, he, having come up through the ranks the way he did, would be willing to be uh, an implementer. And I, I'm going to press him on that. Um, and just in terms of even the FBI, um, Chris Ray and I worked together for Larry Thompson um, when Larry Thompson was the Deputy Attorney General. And I know he has talked as well about even agents on the ground, you know, the kind of work that they're doing and putting these cases together. Um, oftentimes, those agents are really very upset when they see what the outcomes are um, in, in when the sentencing comes to, comes to bear. I've heard criminal justice reform referred to as the last bipartisan issue. Are there other human rights issues that you think could receive bipartisan support? Hmm. Um, human rights issues. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, there. I think ish, I think this was a really good bipartisan one, not just because as uh, my, you know my colleague Representative Collins talked about the moral one, but because there was a financial component to it. And I think that's the piece that really allows bipartisanship. Quite often, as members of Congress, when you're asked to um, bring forward a bill, you have to find a pay for. How do you pay for it? Well, this pays for itself because it's actually reducing the amount of federal funding um, that's utilized for um, criminal justice, if you had called it that. Um, I think er there are other areas. Um, I'm not sure about immigration. Um, but I think that there are, in terms of education, that there is support that we can do. And if you would call social justice climate change, I think that there are small bites at the apple that can be made in terms of climate change. Um, in the last ca caucus, Carlos Carbello um, was the Republican who started with a Democrat the uh, Climate Solutions Caucus. And this was a completely bipartisan caucus. You could not join unless you find, found someone from the other side of the aisle to join with you. And it had a significant number of members. It's just that there was no will from leadership at that time to put any kind of reform up on the table, uh, up for a vote. So I think you may see some of that in this Congress. Uh, last question. Um, one of the uh, components of the First Step Act includes a requirement that the Bureau of Prisons house people within 500 miles of their home in order to maintain good relationship with the families, to help the rehabilitation process and ease the reentry process. How do you anticipate that being enforced for your constituents in the Virgin Islands? Um, a great question. We have a case right now 
um, specifically like that. Of course, for us, the closest federal prison is um, Puerto Rico, which is in abysmal conditions, um, overcrowding, um, lack of you know nonviolent offenders with violent offenders, and. Those are areas, I think the implementation in terms of actually putting people might be easy, but actually creating a prison, a prison that uh, encourages individuals not to be recidivists is uh, something that we're going to have to think about and going to have to make reforms and requirements for. Uh, uh, so I think that's the challenge with the 500, is do you have prisons within 500 um, miles of your home that are uh, environments that actually encourage you um, to be a productive uh, member of society once you leave. That's all the time we have for this segment. Please thank the Congresswoman for joining us. I hand it back to Jack.